Hello there, it's me, Richard Herring. This is Rahula Stapa, and we're at the Lowry in Salford at the moment. We do these things on tour. Here's one we did on tour as well. This is uh, from Birmingham with Adrian Childs, who was very forthcoming. I hope you're going to enjoy this. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, if you want to come and see these shows live, there's some in London, there's some all around the country, and we're doing loads in Edinburgh. Go to richherring.com slash gigs, and you can find out when they are, where, when they're coming up. We've got Brilliant guests like Tony Slattery and Lucy Beaumont in Edinburgh. Loads more to come. Phil Wang. We're going to find out all about what he was wearing in Taskmaster. It's going to be mainly about that. Uh, there's gigs all over the country and all into the autumn and I'm sure into 2020 as well. Go to rahalastaba.co.uk if you want to join in and become a member and uh, get loads of extras uh, as detailed a couple of weeks ago. And if not, sit back, relax and enjoy Rahalastaba with my good friend Adrian Charles for free here on Rahela Stepper, Rahela Stepper. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Birmingham Town Hall. Please welcome a man who's wearing the same jumper he's wearing in the poster for this tour. It's amazing. It's Richard Herring. Oh, yeah, fucking hell. Whoa, thank you very much. Whoa, you guys up there. Amazing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome uh, to the podcast. This is uh, Richard Herring's lifty, Lifting Soggy Tarpaulins uh, podcast. Just change the direction a bit. For uh, yeah, There's a lot of podcasts on the market now. You've got to find your niche. Well, every, I'm going to have a guest every week. We're just going to lift a soggy tarpaulin and find out, find out what's underneath it. But I was... I was hanging out at Mr. Egg uh, the other day. <laughs> Just late night having a bit of an egg. <laughs> Just got a late night hankering for an egg. The, and the original Mr. Egg was there, not the new one, the original Mr. Egg, the good, the proper one. He calls it Rahalastapa, so I don't know if that's going to catch on. So um, this is amazing. There's uh, 1,100 people in here today, uh, this afternoon, which is the biggest audience I've ever had paid to come and see me. Uh, so thank you for that, Birmingham. As I asked before, where were you on my proper gigs? That's, uh, <laughs> thanks for coming to this, though. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's lovely to be in Birmingham. The big news in Birmingham uh, today. Traffic chaos as, uh, as the water, this, the South Staffordshire water are replacing the water mains in Chapel Road. Has that affected a lot of you? <laughs> There's people very upset about that. There was a sinkhole there, apparently. It went off crazy, but no, the traffic's going to be... A lot of you thinking about the drive home now. Am I going to make it... Uh, also, Birmingham is a horrible place, as uh, you will have <laughs> probably know. Uh, Birmingham, of course, is the home of the parents who don't want their children taught about homosexuality. That's what, that's what the rest of the world thinks about you. I think they don't want anyone in Birmingham taught that there's anywhere else other than Birmingham that they could go to to have something nice. The, the people who are trying to teach kids about homosexuality are called No, out, no Outsiders which could be interpreted in two different ways. That is, that's the problem. They're trying to teach about tolerance. I don't know if that's deliberate, but um, it's good. And uh, I have to be careful here because, of course, Birmingham people get very cross if they go to see a football match they don't like the other team. Even if they're from the same city, they'll go and just punch someone. So I have to watch out. There's a lot of rivalry in Birmingham between the different football clubs you have here, which is weird, really, because, I mean, they're all pretty bad. So it's... Uh, I don't, I'd sort of keep it quiet if you liked any of them. <laughs> asking which is the best Birmingham football time is, team is a bit like asking what is the best animal's urine to drink. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's a carpy, obviously, but that's, you know, you know I wouldn't go broadcast it around. Imagine being so angry about, I like cat piss. I'm going to punch that dog piss <laughs> bloke in the head. Um, Birmingham famously has more canals than Venice. Not really the number, is it? The, that's not, it's not really the number of canals that is... It's how pretty the canals are and whether they're surrounded by nice buildings and people on gondolas. That's what the, 
That's the selling point. It's not, oh, we got more, mate. We got, don't go to Venice. We got more. I don't think anyone cares about your canals. If Birmingham was sinking into the sea, I don't think anyone would pay 25p more for their pizza. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> what else have I got for you? Nothing else, I don't think. The traffic chaos. So look, <laughs> we're going to crack on. Um, oh, Birmingham town motto. Not as good as Manchester, but better than Wolverhampton. No, it's not bad, is it? That's, that's not bad. You come third in most things, that is. So my guest today um, is probably best known as the sex party host in Sex Lives of the Potato Men. <laughs> that's why you're here, sir. That's why you, you love that film, don't you? I hope Hope you can get the sex party host guy. Unbelievably true. Will you please welcome Adrian Childs, ladies and gentlemen. He's from Birmingham. He likes football. Welcome. Pick up the mic for that's for you. Talk into that. Adrian Childs from Birmingham. I've just got a couple of apologies first. <laughs> Number one. I can't imagine there's anybody left in Birmingham remotely interested in speaking to me or hearing from me who hasn't done so already in some <laughs> pub or stuff. So I'm sorry. I'm particularly sorry for my brother-in-law who is here and called me last week and said, I've had that ticket for months. <laughs> and now I've got to listen to your drivel again, which if I was interested, I could get for free anyway. <laughs> So anyway, look, you, actually, when they're trying to get me to come on here, they give a list of all the brilliant people you've, uh, you've had on in the past. That yeah. has the opposite effect on me. I say, you know, you, you know, Richard E. Grant and stuff. Why would anybody be interested? So anyway, that's my, I suppose that's my sort we, of... You were just the best bit. I could get. Uh, <laughs> like, 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 well, many a true word said. Yeah. Um, that's... It had sold out before we booked you. And yeah. See, there's a, a lot of people... Yeah, yeah, yeah the whole line gone so there, <laughs> I'm very excited. As I mentioned backstage, I did used to drink uh, in Cafe Nero with, in the same Cafe Nero as you in Hammersmith in King Street. Yeah. And what, I was sitting next to you one time and you had the same Sony Vio as me. So the little one, it was a little Sony. It was a must date it because I've been Mac for a while and I said, oh, how are you finding the Sony Vio? And you, you found it was all right. So, oddly, it's, it's, it, does it get any less boring than this? No, this, this is it. It's going to be mainly about but, the times but, I've met the guests. But I, I must be boring too, because I actually remember that. <laughs> Only once in your life is somebody going to ask you about a Sony Vio. Yeah. Did you recognise okay. me from off the telly? Well, no, I, no, I recognise you as the bloke <laughs> who asked me about my Sony Vio, is, 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 what I, uh, is what I definitely remember. So I just heard you um, slate in Birmingham, which no, is fine. No! Yes, you were. Just given the news. I think the, the important thing to understand about Birmingham is that what it was, it was actually uh, pointed out to me by a, an, an Asian guy who was from Surrey, but was the Midlands correspondent for the BBC for a while. And he said what he loved about Birmingham, he said it's the only place where people are different from, well, from people everywhere else. From Man you know, Manx are always telling you, we're the greatest city in the world. Scousers the same, Glaswegians, Geordies, you know, Londoners. In Birmingham, nobody says that about themselves. <laughs> no, we don't big themselves up. I mean, uh, and there's no greater indication than, than a website, which I'm not sure it's still, it's still on, but it's genuinely promoting Birmingham, and it's called Birmingham, it's not shit.com, <laughs> which, is, which is the best we'll ever say about each other. No, I spent a lot of time working in Manchester, and everywhere you go, they're saying, we're the best, we're the best as a city. Well, that doesn't commend me to anyone. If a bloke walks into a bar and says, hey, I'm brilliant, I'm great, then you think he's a twat. So why would we think that, not think that, about people saying how brilliant their cities are? Yeah, but if someone walks into a pub from Birmingham, you go, oh, no, they're from Birmingham. Yeah. <laughs> There's a certain amount of truth You can in tell that, straight but, I away. Mean, what, you know, we no. don't mind. We're sort of happy enough in our skin not to go around saying how brilliant we are. No. Well. Yes, thank you. Don't applaud it. It's just, just admitting you're rubbish, that's all. So, um... What was the Sex Lives of the Potato Men uh, job? That's, I, don't, I know no, you've done was, some acting. That was, a guy, that was a guy called Andy Humphreys. He was a filmmaker, and he was a big Birmingham City fan. And I interviewed him about an award-winning short film he'd made, so 20 minutes. And I said, look, if you, ever get in a, if, you ever get a feature, if you ever get a feature film, then I want a part in it. <laughs> I said in jest. Then about five years later, I got a call from a casting agency. Or the agent did. I said, a casting agency wants to talk to you. And they said, well... Do you, you want a part in a film called Sex Lives of the Potato Men? 
I said, well, who's, what's that all about? He said, a bloke called Andy Humphreys. I thought, blimey, he's been good to his word. <laughs> so I played myself as the host of a sex party. Um, and it, and it actually, it cured my love of wanting to be an actor because, it, it, I mean, you're paid to hang about. I mean, it was a tiny little role. And I was, I was there three days and nights or something. <laughs> it was astonishing. But... I mean, Johnny Vegas is in this film, um, Mackenzie Crook, um, Dom, somebody, I think, it was, also in, um, it was also in The Office. Can't remember his surname. Nice bloke. But on the day it came out, it, and it got a national release. Now, I didn't realise that films were. I mean, you can make the whole film and get the funding, and then it still can end up not being shown in cinemas or only a few cinemas, but it got a national release. And I was uh, working on a programme, a programme called Working Lunch at the time on BBC Two. So... We got Andy in to be interviewed, um, to be interviewed by me on the Friday, and that was the release date. And I woke up that morning. I was actually coming down from Sheffield, where I'd been filming something, and there was a copy of the Times in um, in, in the lobby. And on the uh, the banner headline on the top of the Times was, <laughs> "Is this the worst British film ever made?" <laughs> so poor Andy had his absolute moment in the sun, and it was absolutely slated by everybody yeah but it, it's actually done good it's done sort of fairly good business since on dvd whether andy's got to make anything else yet i don't know i hope he's done well because he's a, a really nice bloke what did you have to do at the sex party scene i just had to dress i had to well undress i did nobody saw any tackle or anything but i just had a <laughs> in fact i had i started losing weight that day because i was about 18 stone at the time and i had to put a um I put a, a, just a towel around my waist, and that was my costume. And so I put it on, and then I saw myself in the monitor and I, after a few takes, and I, could, I just looked like an aging Joe Bugner or something. <laughs> and then I kept trying to pull it up to get it over the spare tyre, <laughs> but then the continuity woman kept pulling it down again. <laughs> um, but well, that was about it. I said, oh, "All right, how are you doing?" I think that was my only right. that was my only line. But um, so we can't blame you for it not doing well no. or doing or doing well if it's no. doing well now. No, had but, both, I've had both the stars on the podcast before. They were have they? Yeah, yeah. they were. They were. You know, I think they. I think it was unfairly maligned. Possibly, I have not watched it myself. Well, <laughs> but I've, it feels like it, people went you? for it, yeah. but uh, in a bad way. Anyway, uh, there's lots of things I want to talk to you about. Uh, you. Before you were uh, presenting, you did a bit of acting. You were also uh, worked in the civil service. Is that you asked? No, I did a, um, I did a civil. Uh, I, when I left university, I then I then broke my leg and couldn't do sort of couldn't do anything. I was came back home to Hankley um, near here and uh, and just just couldn't walk and for for a year. And in that time, I thought oh, I better apply and do something. One of the things I applied for was the civil service exams. So I I wanted to be a diplomat. So I. I applied for, I did the, the straight civil service exam and then the graduates exam and uh, failed them both, <laughs> uh, to my embarrassment. But then I got, a, I, got a, I got a card through the post and it said that there is other government, these little letters, said that there's other government, though you were unsuccessful, blah, blah, blah. There's some other government work for which you might be considered. And it was, I remember the address was, if you are interested, so reply, um, please reply to the director of establishments. I always remember it's a seemed a peculiar phrase, uh, Ministry of Defence, Whitehall, London or something. So I just wrote, you know, why not? Yeah. Then I got a call. Well, okay, well, you can, can you come to an interview? And it was addressed on the Tottenham Court Road. And then well, I remember when I got, I may had to drive me down because I still had a, my leg was still in plaster. And so I got to this address, and this woman took me into this sort of room. Instead of you parked anywhere, I said no. I said, well, why'd you ask? And she said, because it's going to take about three hours. No, what are you going to talk about for three hours? And it was the most forensic interview. I mean, no stone on time. It was like, so tell me about your primary school. What were your friends like? Who you, who you hang around with? And mm -hmm. sport? And what did you do? And just, there was no stone left on turn. And she got to the end. He said, now I can, I can tell you, um, uh, you know, I can tell you what this job is about now. And I thought, well, you know, that's a relief. And she said, I'm not from the Ministry of Defence, as you might have suspected. And I went... Mm, yeah, I don't know. What, I, uh, he says, I'm from, um, I'm from MI5. And I, I will never forget it. Literally, there's a couple of times in my life when the ground has shifted between my feet. I just could not believe what she was saying. <laughs> and she said, right, I'm going to leave you alone now. You need to read this. And then uh, I'll come back in and talk to you a bit more about what the job entails. 
So I was like, Hi, hyperventilating there. <laughs> well, this document, it said classified and top secret. I mean, it literally is like something out of a... If you saw that in a comedy, you think yeah. it's not really like that, but it is like that. It just it did say those words on it. So then she left the room, and on reflection, I think I must have been being filmed then, because I just... Because, I mean, I, and if I was, that's, you know, it wouldn't have looked good because I was going, <laughs> I just didn't know what to put. Paced around the room a bit, looked at this thing, couldn't take anything in. And then she came in, she made me sign it. Um, and, then, and then she came in and she asked me, and then she told me, I asked a load of questions, and she told me kind of what the job entails. Basically said it's very boring. I remember, let's see, I remember asking her, so what do your friends think you do then? What do, what, what do you friends think you do for me? And said, oh, look, you tell somebody you work in the civil service. It's an absolute conversation stopper straight away. <laughs> there, there are no supplementaries. But um, she said, you can only tell your mom, you can only tell your immediate family. Yeah. So I went home. I didn't say anything for a while. Then I was sitting just having something to eat in the evening with my mom and dad. And I was get, getting up to this. I got told the whole story up to when she said, you know, I'm not from the Ministry of Defence. I'm, uh, I'm, from, I'm from MI5. And my dad looked astonished. My mom looked baffled and then the doorbell went my mate was there or something and then he, he and, and then I went whoever it was went the other room or something. and I went into the, back into the kitchen and my dad was a god well my mum was baffled my mum was Croatian and you know then some the English isn't absolutely perfect but she thought the woman had said uh, I'm not from the Ministry of Defence I'm from MFI <laughs> <laughs> which uh, no wonder she looked baffled. <laughs> Signing the Official Secrets Act. All for sort of flat yeah. pack furniture. Yeah. But anyway, then uh, two weeks later, I got a note saying, uh, we don't want you. <laughs> Which was actually the right decision. Because she, something she said to me after, said, look, I, I, get the, I get the sense that you need affirmation in your job. You need to tell people what you do. And obviously, if you're a you know, you're doing you know, roughly analogous to kind of what you do. You know, you can't, it's not something you can do in secret. You know, you, you, you crave approval. <laughs> That's exactly what the Russians think. Playing the slow so anyway, game. I think she made the, uh, I think she made the, made the right dis decision. Maybe. I mean, like, like most anecdotes you exaggerate, I've exaggerated nothing there. I mean, it is. Are you allowed to tell that story though? Because this is going to go out. No, no, the, no, no. I mean, I, look, I'm sure you're not, but I don't know what they're going <laughs> to. If I, if I get shot from long range or I die in unexplained circumstances, then I'll yeah. you know, look after my family, will you? I will do. The thing is, if you had got the job, you would still say you hadn't got That's the job. That's true. <laughs> You'd say it more. Who am I supposed to spy on? Like the crowd at West Brom or anyone who works for the BBC well, or something? As we know, yeah. people in Birmingham yeah. are awful and need to be yeah, spied yeah. on at the time. If you'd been spying on that bloke before yeah. he went and hit that guy, you just could have stopped him, could yeah. you? I know that wasn't West Brom, but it's all the same to me. <laughs> Why did you choose West Brom out of the uh, you three, don't or your clubs. three or, three or your six? Clubs choose the, your clubs choose you, yeah. don't they? So I just I love my granddad, and my granddad was an Albion fan, so I sort of went up, I went up, I went up every, every week with him, and it's just become... An absolute illness. I thought it would get better. <laughs> I thought it would get better. I go there in the same spirit. I might go and visit an aged relative. <laughs> you know, an, an ailing relative. You know, I go out of duty. Yeah. And you do it and then you leave and then you go back next time. Interestingly, my daughter, when she was little, I used to drag her there. And she, the younger one, sort of would go from time to time. And, uh, but she didn't go anymore. She's now 16. And a, a friend of mine I go to the album with, she, she saw her elsewhere and she asked her, um, so why, why don't you go? And she said, it's, I, so I don't mind being there. It's just the thought of being there. That's so <laughs> well, actually, interesting, with me, it's the other way around. Being there is shit. But actually, the thought of being there, for some reason, excites me. Or rather, I find the thought of not being there absolutely unbearable. It, it's interesting. That if, if there's a game coming up, and let's say, let's say we got Birmingham next Friday night. If I knew I couldn't go there, if I knew I couldn't go to that game for some reason, I'd feel sick and wrong all week. Yeah. But at such time as that game finished, I wouldn't care at all that I wasn't there. Because if we'd lost, I'd be thinking, well, thank God I wasn't there. If we'd <laughs> won, I'd be thinking, I'd be so delighted I wouldn't care. And if we drew, it'd be something in between the two. Yeah. So, you know, I was hoping I'd be released from this nightmare, but there is no end to it. 
I support York City, so West Brom is like unbelievably high. Yeah, in the, in yeah, the but, like, but everyone. But I think that's a bit of a myth about which foot, there's the same pain for everybody in football because not whoever, as much as there is for York City, no, mate. But, I but, tell no, you. no, but it's the pain. It's all relative. <laughs> it's all relative to the. It's relative to what you expect to attain. So if you Manche- if you're a Manchester United fan, you know it, it's a disaster if you finish second. So you've got that level of pressure. If you're West Brom fan, it's a disaster if you got relegated, which we did. But, you know, it's finishing 17th in the Premier League was, was, you know, was fantastic for us. So, I mean, everybody, apart from perhaps two fans of two teams, end the season bloody miserable. That's, that, that's just how it is. <laughs> I mean, happens. football's just stupid, isn't it? So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think it is. That's what I would say. I don't, I don't, yeah. don't worry too much about it. <laughs> no, not to, like, not most of what you do in your job, but... <laughs> It's a waste well, of time. It's a waste of time. Yeah. Why don't they all just play once and then just that's it? <laughs> but I think perhaps they should just <laughs> not do anything for a year, just yeah. cancel football for a year, yeah. and everybody can just have a word with themselves. You know, like farmers used to. <laughs> farmers used to have to leave fields fallow yeah. for a year. Just let's just shut the fuck up about it for a whole year. <laughs> <laughs> not worry about it and then come back the following season no transfer news yeah. no ups and downs well hopefully we'll have another world war and that's the kind of thing that happens yeah. Yeah, so if we have a world war yeah it's probably going to you know happen. I have the season of 9-11 we got relegated that we had a nightmare season and we were facing relegation I honestly found myself thinking idly thinking <laughs> like, if there was an atrocity here like a nuclear attack they'd have to cancel the season in February <laughs> and we couldn't go down that's dark, that, isn't it? it is. Even if that involved my own death, <laughs> it still felt preferable to relegation. <laughs> so, but any Albion Blues or Villa fans here will know exactly what I mean by that. You know, we're all in this together. It is. It's like interesting you say West Brom and in another city, people go, Boo! but everyone's going, yeah, we're all shit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. There's no point. Can you get somebody to move forward and sit in these seats? Here? They're <laughs> no. really. They're... It's like a whole family of Birmingham people yeah, decided just not thought, to. just thought, who's our... Oh, fuck <laughs> it. <laughs> everyone, everyone else still came. I didn't really broadcast who it was going to be. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about. Uh... Well, it's, it, you, I remember you from working lunch. That's when I first saw you. I didn't really. It wasn't a show I tuned into all the time because yeah. it was about business and stuff. Yeah. But you know, I was w- working from home, and sometimes neighbours also. It was interesting. So... When, that... <laughs> and when that when that first started, somebody did say to me, "Look, it's just not going to work. It's a business program for people who aren't interested in business," which is kind of true. And he was right, but it did last for thirteen years yeah. and sort of got a bit of a following. Interestingly, I meet I meet kids now who are now the kids who are watching it then. You know, are now running hedge funds, driving around in Ferraris. <laughs> you know, I meet them somewhere and say, oh, it's you that got me into business. I say, well, good for you as they get into their <laughs> chauffeur-driven Bentley or whatever. <laughs> so they're sitting as seven-year-olds watching it. And, uh, you know, it did well by them. But actually, I'm prouder of that programme than anything I've done, actually. Because everything we did get on that, we, we, you know, we kind of earned for ourselves. And also, it's in such a backwater, lunchtime on BBC Two. The big advantage of that is that nobody cares about you. You're not costing them much. As long as you don't libel anyone or do anything completely stupid, you can just get on with it. And sort of creatively, without you know, bringing it to sound like a bit of a wanker, you can just get, you can try different things. If they don't work, try yeah. something else. If you're absolutely banging the spotlight on a, you know, doing you know, football, Champions League football or something, there's, there's precious little room for experimentation because you try something and you know, the, 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 the walls of hell come tumbling down upon sure. you if people don't like it. Yeah, well, that's, but that's why it sort of stuck out because you're this funny presenter on yeah. a show that people were chancing. Because similarly, my last TV show was on lunchtime on a Sunday, which people weren't expecting comedy, yeah. you know, a comedy show or a rude comedy show. And so then it was like, oh my goodness, this, this, yeah. this amazing thing's happening that's sort of secret. But yeah. that, was the, that was probably the secret of your success. Well, I suppose was it was. You... It was also having a, having a Midlands accent, which people always say, you know, how, how do you get on telly with a horrendous accent like that? And, uh, and uh, for me, I've always taken it I've always taken it as a positive because there is no doubt about it. If people hear you with a Birmingham accent, they think you're stupid, right? It's just, we've just got to accept that. <laughs> now, I, I never minded that, even at college, whatever. But certainly at the BBC, 
because you just underestimated. You're better off starting any interview, any situation with people thinking you are stupid because then you've got to do relatively little to impress them. <laughs> so, no, I'm, so, I'm absolutely deadly serious. So I went to, I, when I, I first, my first introduction to the BBC, I got a work experience um, through a, a, a friend of mine, a girl from Hagley, who was on work experience there herself. And um, on business programs on the a, a, a television centre. And so I walked in there, just knuckles dragging along the ground. You know, what to do. They never heard anybody with an accent, accent like me, mine. And, and so I they didn't know what to do with me. So then I, you know, I dragged myself into some planning meeting they were having. They're all sitting around, probably 10 or 15 of them. And I soon realised all I had to do was just construct one coherent sentence. <laughs> I swear, they looked at me like, well, Stephen fucking Hawking or something. <laughs> this boy is a genius. Oh, my God, he, he's something special. You know, but somebody who's been to sort of Charterhouse and Cambridge isn't going to have that advantage. I felt, I felt really sorry for a lot of them because more was expected of them. Fair enough. It's rude to the, all these people who have the same accent as you but couldn't get on TV, though, yeah. as a result. So that's... <laughs> Well, look, it's probably because you didn't, you, you didn't, you know, you didn't try. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Just turn up. Go waste the ball for you. Um, That's how you speak. <laughs> Just exact replica of that. And so it, you kind of went on this journey, I guess, with your career that they went from that to, to getting on to the one show is that's, yeah. well, that's I quite the, the a tip, when I, I was I was a long time on working I was 13 years on working and sort of barely yeah. noticed sort of under the radar and I was doing radio as well actually the tipping point was The Apprentice actually yeah which always felt like a bit of a cheek I don't think I'd really earned it it was the you know I was the presenter of the of the after show which in itself was piggybacking on, on The Apprentice itself which yeah. itself was an American format that had been brought over here so I remember talking to the controller of the um, uh, controller of BBC One at the time, Peter Fincham, who said, "Look, you know, you, 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 you said think of it like this: you, know, you score a tapping in the semi-final, you know, the cop or something. You're not going to go. Well, I didn't really earn that. Somebody else made the goal. Look, like, just <laughs> put it in the nets, on you know, and you'll be fine. So that was kind of a big success, and then everything everything seemed to flow flow from that. You know, I actually and I found the whole rise." and rise at that point, absolutely bewildering. And I found the equally precipitous <laughs> decline just as bewildering, but obviously in, uh, not in a good way. Yeah. But that's it. Well, you know, it was going into a new era. I suppose that does make sense for that leap. But then was there any, would, when you got off, was the one show, had, 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 was it a thing that existed before? No, no, you, no, so no. you started No, that was, show. I mean, I always remember the, uh, the, the previous controller of BBC One, Peter Salmon, said... You know, I would never have had the balls to commission that. Because you think about it, you have given over a slot, however many weekdays in the year, I think it's 256 or 232 shows a year from seven till half seven. You've given that slot to, to a programme. Yeah. Now, if that programme doesn't work, it's a nightmare for, a, it's a nightmare for, the, uh, for, for, the, for the control. Because what you do, you kind of stop with it. You can't pull it because then you've got to put a load of, you know, you've got to put 200. 20 other shows in there. So it was real sort of balls to do. We actually, um, <laughs> we actually uh, piloted it here, but it was an on-air pilot for, I think, for three weeks in one August in 2006. And there's, a, there's an area by the canal at the back of the mailbox here. We're, they built a studio there in sort of a porter cabin. And I look at that space now, and it gets smaller and smaller. I mean, you couldn't put a tennis court on there. So I don't know how we... I don't know how we sort of managed to fit a programme in. But I, the co-presenter then was Nadia Sawala, whom we, we got on well. And again, we thought, oh, sod it, it's a pilot. Let's just All ask right. about a bit. <laughs> I, went, no, I went out with her sister. No, not like that. I went out with her sister. They, um, they, they and then, went. no, but then, and then, and then it's, uh, <laughs> then it's, then, then it seemed, then it seemed to work. But I remember, I mean, we're into the second week. I thought we're onto the, uh, we're on to, we're onto something here. Uh, it was going to work. And I remember the, Al the season had started by then and I was walking to the Albion along the Birmingham Road and there was a bloke sat on a wall where the Hawthorns pub used to be. And he went, all right, Aidan. I went, yeah, all right. And he goes, uh, the one show. He goes, fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> I went, that's, that's all he said. Yeah. I went, 
You know, it's funny, I'll never... It's, it's a never, fair never, review, it's, it's you a know. fair review. <laughs> I'll never get used to the... I'm not on social media at all. I'll never get used to sort of feedback, sort of, from the public. And it's not, it's not the kind of loathing you sometimes get, because people don't give you that generally in public. I mean, you might get a bit of sleep, but generally people are nice to you or ignore you or, I don't know, laugh behind their hands at you. But, you know, I've had a whole array in my time. And the, 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 there was one that absolutely killed me about six months ago, coming back from Manchester. And, as, and what, classically what happens, the question I answer a million times a day, I mean, not a million, obviously not a million, I would say literally ten times a day, is, oh, you're not on telly anymore. <laughs> I don't know what the response is. I say, oh no. Well, I've been fucking filming something. Are they not putting that out? <laughs> but you know, you're, you're, you're just, your, your, your shortcomings or your sudden lack of success, uh, you know, I just I, I, I pointed out to you, it pointed out to you, I pointed out to you every day. And sometimes people look at you like a ghost, because to some extent, it's like you've stopped existing. They think you were dead or something. Yeah. But you know, oh my God, it's you. You, yeah. you know, it's. it's was I, was I can't on... really identify with this. No, no. <laughs> but, um, I, got on the, um, I got on the tram in Manchester going from Media City to Piccadilly last week. There's a, load of, there's a load of primary school kids on there with little high-vis things. I've been on a, been on a trip to um, the Imperial War Museum in Salford. And um, so I started chatting to them. They had a couple of teachers with them and everything. They're really good kids. So what do you want to be? So I want to be a Marvel superhero. And then this other little girl said, uh, well, actually, she stood up and said, excuse me, sir, would you like to sit down? I went, no, you're all right, Angel. <laughs> anyway, she wanted to be uh, an actress, a singer, or a dancer. And she, and she said, if I couldn't live my dream, I'd be a nurse. <laughs> and I'd do all the mocky stuff. But actually, interestingly, so I'm, I'm uh, sort of veering off a bit, but she, she, then, she then stood up and said, what did you want to be when you were little like me? And I thought, wow, what a great question that is. And, and the point is not what the answer is, which isn't that interesting. But, I mean, she had curiosity. I knew at that instant that little curl would go far. Because don't you think what you want from people is, is curiosity? I don't care anymore what people know, or importantly, what they think they know. I'm interested in what people want to know. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? If, yeah. if people just aren't curious about anything, I don't, I don't quite get that. But anyway, on that tram, I own that tram. Those kids bloody love me. They were <laughs> And, I, you know, and, they, and they, they, you know, I, it gave me more pleasure than anything I'd done in the three hours broadcasting <laughs> I'd done before. Um, anyway, and also I knew they didn't know who I was or anything. So I thought, well, I've earned this, you know, I've earned this. It felt like a performance. Anyway, I came to get off. And the, one, the teacher stood up and said, children, can I say something? Something you need to know about this gentleman. He used to be famous. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, kids. <laughs> and off we went. But anyway, on the train, I had the usual... I got on the train about six months ago. It honestly <laughs> happened. The bloke opposite me was a really nice guy. He said, oh, um, I haven't seen you on telly anymore. I went, no shit. Can't think. Anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I said, he's what we said, um, I said, you know, I did the football and everything. I do radio and everything. Uh, and he goes, do you know what? You tried your best. <laughs> <laughs> But it's a good job the train doors don't open on those verges. Now. All right, yes, I did. <laughs> Ta-da, then. And just well, leap that, it's also because you know, but it's that—that's the price of becoming super successful. So, like, it is yeah. getting beyond beyond that level where yeah. the working lunch level, even yeah. the apprentice level, yeah. and then you're you're in people's seat rooms yeah, every yeah. single night. And then, you? but actually, um, it's interesting. There's a there's a guy I know. He worked. He um, he was head of. He was uh, head of comms at West Brom, very popular figure in the business. And in the end, he, he left he, for whatever reason. And he, put his, he nailed it for me when he said, you know, the trouble in the kind of the issue he has, although he's become very successful again, is that it's, it, the problem is when you're defined by what you used to do yeah. or what you used to be, rightly or wrongly. That's quite, actually quite difficult. That's quite difficult to do with. I've got a, there's another one, actually. It's, what's when, it's, it's one of the reasons I stay off social media. <laughs> One of the many reasons, but the, it's interesting when you do a, a successful program. If you do if you do a program that's not working well and everyone slates it, but then I did the program about drinking, you know, which went down really well. Even on, you know, I was told on social media, and then a friend of mine sent me a sent me a tweet. Somebody 
somebody <laughs> said about it, and he said, God knows I fucking hate this content. <laughs> but this is a brilliant program. <laughs> Where do you go with that? <laughs> How do you process that? <laughs> but the thing is, I mean, that, I think as a comedian, you sort of... I mean, some comedians don't realise it, but like, ultimately, you can't... Not, not everyone's going to like what you're doing. As no. a comedian, you kind of realise it, because to be a good comedian, you have to have that reaction from certain people. Everyone who, who does that to me, I go, yeah, great, that means... I'm, that means yeah, as long as yeah. everyone isn't doing that, what yeah. I'm doing is working. Yeah, because, yeah. you know, I'm meant to be rubbing people up. And in a way, way, I mean, that is the biggest compliment. If you, if you can put, it, if yeah, you can put a positive spin on it, then, you know, it must have hurt him to, to like the programme. Well, A, you like the pro programme, and B, you're a really amazing cunt as well. So that is, that's two. <laughs> that's I was another one. Actually, positive. I was in, uh, I remember New Year's Day, I was in Liverpool for a football match, and we yeah. had a few drinks, and... Um, and then we were going up to Anfield, the Albion were playing there. And walking up, and there's a, a proper scouse that came down. I can't do a Liverpool accent. But he goes, hey, you're that cunt off the telly, aren't you? <laughs> I went, yes, that's me. What can you say to that? Off you go. <laughs> I'm getting quite stressed recording all, uh, <laughs> recording all. You just reminded me about something about <laughs> testicles, actually. Oh, really? <laughs> Earlier when you... Okay, was, was that, that in a warm up? Was that on air? You, I just, I, you honestly put something in my head. I've forgotten about when you get over the age of fifty. You can oh, yes, sit on your, you can sit on your testicles. Well, I was fifty-two on Thursday, and I haven't got to that stage. But I suddenly remember. I, I literally haven't thought about this in what must be <laughs> 46, 47 years. Seeing my granddad naked, <laughs> and just, just how. Just being, I buried it away, it was so horrific, but yeah. just how low they hung. Yeah. <laughs> that's the future, my, my that's the future of your yeah. testicles. You've got, seen the future. Yeah. The other testicle story I have, since you didn't ask, <laughs> but I'll tell you. In 1978, it was the day that Arsenal played Ipswich in the FA Cup final. Yes. I, uh, I got on my bike at lunchtime, midday, just to cycle to the little, little down, down the road to my nan's house, and it was raining, and they had a short little steep drive. I was all excited to get down, I was going too fast, put my brakes on, because it was wet, brakes didn't work, smashed, into the, smashed into, the, into the house, basically into the wall of the house, and sort of up against the window, but not through it, where my granddad was sitting reading the, reading the Birmingham Post. Anyway, I was howling, went in to the front, on the front, into, knocked on the front door and they let me in they said, I'll just lay on the floor howling and then they looked down and for some reason maybe I later found out because I was covered in blood down here and they pulled my tracksuit bottoms down and basically I half sliced off my entire sort of pack I don't know how else so basically <laughs> the whole thing was like that wow. so it was hanging on <laughs> and then <laughs> so I remember my nah, it's a, my nan called my mom and said, yeah. I'm afraid you'll have to come straight away. Adrian's cut himself in rather a funny place. <laughs> <laughs> so then they came down. There I was, my trousers around my ankles yeah. and my bollocks hanging off. Yeah. <laughs> and they said, we better go to hospital. Quite right. So we went to the Corbett Hospital in Stourbridge. And an Irish nurse, remember, yep. Yeah? <laughs> Cheer, because you recognise yeah. the hospital. There's a boy with yeah. his testicles hanging off. Yeah. <laughs> so the Irish nurse came in, I remember. The doctor had a look at it. He said, just sew it up, which seemed straightforward enough. So it was all sewed back. I yeah. had internal stitches and, yeah. you know, everything sewn back up. And I was put in this kind of harness. I mean, there wasn't a lot to, that needed support in. I was little, but I was only 11. Um, so this little... To put this on this harness, put my trousers on, went back, back in time for kickoff. Perfect. <laughs> but then the neighbours started coming round. And my, I remember <laughs> my mom, and halfway through the first half, Ipswich had just scored. Yeah. And my uh, mum said, uh, your, your auntie Kay's come round from next door to have a look. Show what you've done. So I stood up. <laughs> All right. Pull my trousers down. There's a huge harness arrangement with this tiny little winkle. <laughs> Pop out. All right. OK, thanks. It's a bit sore. Anyway, sat down, watched the football. <laughs> 
But actually, I didn't realise my parents were worried for years it would have some detrimental effect on my, uh, on my fertility, which, yeah. having fathered children, apparently it didn't. So whatever she did with those internal stitches, she put them in the right, uh, put them in the right place. And you... It's funny how you've got your legs positioned now. <laughs> I've been, uh, told you that did, do you have like a, is it like Frankenstein down there now? Is it all? Uh, no, it's uh, it's. Uh, uh, you, so you get the say you don't really look at it no. much anymore, do you? So uh, no, they've it's, all kind of got that scar up the back anyway, haven't they? So yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, mate. It's <laughs> <laughs> where the penis fuses together in utero. <laughs> we can talk about that more later. So have you seen, uh, back to the one show, yeah. which is all I was interested in, Adrian. Right, okay. Thanks for the story about your <laughs> severed penis and p testicles that I did not request. <laughs> have you seen the new Alan Partridge show? Uh, <laughs> actually, I must say, I must say I haven't. Um, <laughs> but I saw, I saw bits of it, but I just, I was in a, I, I don't know, I was out somewhere, what, somewhere, I didn't have my phone on. I, was, I, was, I switched my phone on, then it was, I was like 40 texts. I thought, what's happened? Somebody died or something. <laughs> I realised that he'd, he'd, he'd mentioned my name, which is a great honour. I mean, on that show, definitely, I was sob Alan Partridge. <laughs> I just, uh, it was, you know, you couldn't make, you couldn't, I'm reminded of some of the stuff, some of the stuff that happened. I mean, I, I don't think I was a twat, but I was a, I was a bit of one at times. But it just, you just get used to, just used to just stuff happen, starts to become the norm. And just like little things, like, remember there was trying to, did one, you know, I wouldn't allow to go in my own clothes and I wouldn't trust it to be dressed properly. So, you know, I'd sort of go in and then you go into the wardrobe room and there'd be a, there was a nice Australian woman who just told me what I was going to wear and I gave up arguing. So I was, so she, she gave me some trousers and I put them on and then I put my shoes on and then, and then my phone went, I was on my phone and then I thought, well, why don't she tie my fucking shoes up? I mean, subconsciously I found, I was looking, I was going, <laughs> you know, you might, and I just realised, she said, I think you can probably tie your own fucking shoes <laughs> But I'd, I'd somehow come to, you know, it had yeah. somehow become the norm. And you become, like, footballers are completely infantilised in the sense that you go, you know, I went, I went training with West Brom once, it was about 20 years ago. They didn't even have their own training ground, so it wasn't a well-funded club at all. So I went in all my football kit and everything because I was training with them. I realised the players don't. You get there, and my kit, like theirs, was all laid out. But, I mean, everything. Yeah. But the pants... They were green Marks and Spencer slips, you know, nice. little briefs. Yeah, yeah. And they're like that. You literally could turn up naked or in your pyjamas <laughs> or, or a suit of armour or whatever. Yeah. Fine. It's all laid out for you. So no wonder they become like hopeless sheep. You know, they're not allowed to look after their own passports. They don't feed themselves. Everything's washed for them. You know, it was a, you, be, you, know you became... I, you know, I certainly became infantilised. Like. Yeah. Well, it's good. TV is that, you know, that you, you can understand why to an extent why people go crazy in, in lots of different ways, sportsmen and TV yeah. stars, when you're treated with that level of... It, you're so important, so if you're a bit of an idiot, you'll get someone yeah. to tie your shoes. If you're a real idiot, you'll end up having to go to prison. Yeah. Uh, so it's, you know, because... Well, because, no, no, absolutely. Because, yeah. you know, because you're treated in that way, and then everyone yeah. is also, you know, you, you sort of see it. If, if the star of the show falls and is no longer the star of the yeah. show everyone else falls around them as well, yeah. so, you know... But they... there, there was something about the pace of that show, because it was so breathtakingly quick. You know, you'd be, you'd be on for half an hour, or 27 minutes or whatever it is, and there'd be, always be four films on there about, you know, there'd be, I don't know, cot death would then go into sort of badgers, yeah. would then go into something about the, the history of toasters or something. And, the, and then in between, they'd, you have to crowbar in a bewildered... <laughs> I mean, the most bewildered one we had was Michael Stipe. I remember. <laughs> Who, and he shortly retired from everything after he retired from everything shortly after that. But um, but you only ever had three minutes maximum. Yeah. And if you think it was two of you presenting it, so you only get sort of one or two questions each. But I lost the ability to have a long conversation. I mean, even in the pub, I start talking to somebody. Go right, one question, two questions. Right, okay, thanks. Off you go. You forgot how to do something sort of long. You know, any you know, just have a normal conversation. Yeah. It must have been, you couldn't tell the story about cutting your genitals in half, could you? That would have been, it well, didn't, wasn't time. I don't think I have. I'm really looking forward to watching this back because we're going to put the, 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 the uh, sign out in, the, in a little box in the corner. I'm really looking forward to watching that, <laughs> that story back to see. 
you all saw it here. But the, you, you you end up leaving uh, the one show yeah. because of only you, you were sort of peeved at Chris Evans. Well, it wasn't. It, it was just. Look, I think anybody would feel the same. I was, you know, the from that pilot we did out the by the canal basin in Birmingham. Yeah. We turned it into this massive success. You know, five or six million people would would watch it in the night, and then suddenly it was. Oh, but we're doing a bigger show on Friday, and we don't want you to present it. We want Chris Evans to do it. Now I've got I've no ill will about for Chris Evans at all. I've always got on well with him and everything, but you know, and he'd understand why I get the hump if the boot had been on the foot. Chris Evans would have got the hump. So we tried for ages to say, look, just don't do it, don't do it. But the controller of BBC One was absolutely determined to do it. So then I would have been in the position of doing the you know Monday to Thursday slogging away doing that show and all the energy and excitement in the amongst the production team would be for the new bigger better yeah uh, you know one hour show which was happening on the Friday so we tried to stop it I mean we've got the same agent you can imagine what you know imagine how furious <laughs> he was maneuvering every man like mad but it just couldn't stop it. and then and then I was going to have to wear it I was resigned to wearing it in the 11th hour ITV came in with a big offer and so sort of you know, off I went. But if that hadn't happened, there's no way I would have gone anywhere. No. You know, because why would I? I was doing The Apprentice, I was doing Match of the Day, I was doing the one show, and so on. I remember the, just as it was looking as I was, was going to go to ITV, it was in the offing, I got a call from Alan Sugar, you know, which is always, you know, a worrying moment when his number kind of crops up on my phone. And he said, he said, what are you, uh, you know, what are you doing? I explain what I explain to you. And he said, uh, he said, look, I'll say this to you. You know, I've done things in a rush of temper in my life many times. You know, what a surprise. He said, and it has, it has cost me millions. So just be careful. I said, fine. I said, but look, you've got to understand. Say The Apprentice. Big success it is. Suddenly they said, right, you, thanks, Alan. You're doing all the shows, right, until the final. But we'll bring Richard Branson in for the final. <laughs> he said, what would you do? And he said, I'd tell him to fuck off. He said, well, why are you having a go at me? He said, well, <laughs> he said, the difference is, I've got 867 million quid in the bank. <laughs> as far as I know, he said, you haven't. So think carefully. Fair play, Alan. He was, yeah. he was right. But we, we sort of stayed friends. And in fact, the day it was announced, when he... When he um, it's funny, the same thing happened in a different way when I was sacked from ITV in the end. But on the day I went to... Um, uh, the day it was announced that I was going to ITV. I remember I was on my, in my car, and it was on the car phone, and he said, uh, the phone when it was Alan, I thought, oh, my God, he's going to bloody tear me a new one here. And he went, look, I just want to say, you know, I really enjoy working for you. I think it might be a mistake, but I really wish you all the best. Hope we we'll still be friends. And then, like, I really got emotional. It, you know, it's a bit like that bloke who was slating me on Twitter and then saying, but it's a brilliant programme. It's like coming from him. Yeah. <laughs> The other one is when I got, when it was announced, when it got in the papers, that I was no longer required to present the football on ITV, which you can imagine was a like, big humiliation. And there was like a photographer outside my flat, and this was all kicking off. It was on the news and everything. And I thought, oh, God, right, here we go. So walked out of the house. Photographer, I was trying to dodge him, but I went the other way, and he came sprinting round. And I remember somebody, had, so Frank Skinner had actually said, you know, if something bad's happened, you've got to smile, because the shot they want is of you looking miserable, which is my default look. <laughs> so that of all mornings to be forcing a smile. So anyway, he came, he, he sort of got the picture and then, and then he, it was a really bright sunny day and he, he just looked a bit crestfallen and I realised, I said, I don't know what's happened here. The sun's behind me so you can't see a thing, can you? And he went, do you want me to walk the other way? And he went, yeah. So, all right, so he stood the other way, and then <laughs> it, it really helped me paint the smile on. And it was a, you know, so I could smile walking the other way. Anyway, I, I had to go and see my dentist that day. I was taking loads of calls from people and, and stuff, but uh, I walked all the way into, into, the middle of, into the middle of London where my dentist was. He was a mate, and he says, you all right? I said, yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine. And then it was the most peaceful half hour, because I didn't actually have to talk. It's great being the dentist. You just don't have to talk. You're messing around your mouth. And then I finished, and I'd been fine all day. I felt fine. And then I got a text from Roy Keane, right? <laughs> and he said, look, I'm absolutely gutted for you. It was along the lines, I can show you it later, I can't see some of my phones away. I'm gutted for you, you know, I really enjoyed working with you and I consider you a friend, you know, and I hope we get to work together again. At which point, I completely lost it. <laughs> because, you know, when Roy Keane's got his arm around your shoulder, you know you're fucked. <laughs> something really, something really terrible, you know, must have happened. But actually, Roy has been absolutely good to his word. You know, I know we're not close friends with him, but he's always kept in touch. He's always got my... I had some friends from Israel who were, 
who were coming over for the, it was the boys' bar mitzvah, and he was a big Man United fan, and it was a big Man United game. He said, can you get us a ticket? And I said, actually, they had to come on a Sunday because they couldn't go on a Saturday because they're sort of Orthodox Jews. I said, Roy, right. can you do anything? You know, and he broke his balls to get him a ticket and leave them there, you know. And that stuff is, you know, that, that stuff's important, you know. So it's, you know, I'll kind of sort of value that in him and, and many others I work with. Sure. So, I mean, it's, it's in, do you think that the part, of the part of it was, you know, you'd build, it's the British ways and you get built up, you get built up and then people sort of wanted you to fail or do you think it was um, just the shift in the timing think, of the no, day? I think... Because it's the same relationship. Think, look, yeah, a number of things, just a number of things went on. I think that our selling point was the same with Christine. We were both sort of the boy next door, the girl next door, who against sort of improbable odds, her, some of being from Northern Ireland, um... You know, me, apart, you know, despite my accent and my looks and everything, managed to, you know, get on, you know, get on, you know, make a success. So, you know, people felt part of your success. But then you get a big job and everyone starts talking about telephone numbers you're earning. Then you yeah. can't be the boy next door anymore. It's interesting. I went, something, something struck me once. When I was, um, uh, it, it was somebody famous and successful I knew I went out with for a bit. And I'm, I'm saying to her, oh, God, we're so lucky, you know, we've done... You know, we've done, you know, I feel so lucky, you know, we've done well, you've done well, we're lucky, lucky. And then she, she said, look, don't fucking involve me in that. If you want to consider yourself lucky, you consider yourself lucky. But, you know, I'm here because I'm fucking good, I'm funny, I'm brilliant at what I do and work my ass. I'm not lucky, I deserve this. Now, she wasn't being arrogant, but she was making a point, I thought, yeah, that's right, you can't go around all the time thinking, this is just luck, although I still do. And then... When I was then earning a lot of money, not as much as in the papers, but I was, you know, by any estimation, it was a lot of money. I realized you kind of, you kind of, you end up loathed for that. And I sort of get that, you know, life's hard for struggles for a lot of people, you know, and I don't lose sight of that. But I realized I was being hated more for what I was earning doing something than, say, I'd won five million quid on the lottery. Yeah. People go, oh, no, fair play, put it on the lottery. Then, but then obviously that is luck. <laughs> yes. So why would you be hated less for that than doing a job, which in some in people's estimation wasn't particularly good, but at least I was working for it in some measure. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's strange. But, the, you know, it is, it, that's the way the world, you know, people are <laughs> logical yeah. as we're seeing in the world yeah. now, uh, in general. Yeah. But what, what I found doing, the, I, I am genuinely and I bore myself, I'm genuinely negative. I literally, well, I'm staying with my parents tonight in Hagley. If I get back there alive, it's, I don't even take that for granted. And it's literally just getting on a train, going you to Hagley and walking back to their house. You, you know, I just, it's, no, but it's like a pleasant <laughs> surprise to survive another day. I'm, I'm yes. very negative about sort of everything. I mean, so I think it's from being a West Brom fan, seriously, I think that's a, con a contributing factor. But I honestly said, I remember saying to Christine and the guy who came from, um, from the one show with us to, 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 work, on, uh, to work on Daybreak, I, I said, this is absolutely going to work. I feel sure of it. And Christine was looking at me. Fuck, this is a worry, this is. I've never heard you bloody confident about anything. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm never going to be confident about anything again because it just didn't work. Well, actually, fan, the key problem is, and it's absolutely critical if you're on a breakfast show, is that I'm just no bloody good in the morning. I don't... <laughs> I mean, I don't mind being up, having a read, drinking a coffee, having a walk. Yeah. Great. But I just don't want to fucking talk to anybody, <laughs> which, is, which is just completely useless. It could be you know. good. I'd, quite, I'd, like, I'd watch that show. Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I get it, because my wife's like that anyway in the morning, so basically I get that show every morning. Yeah. <laughs> we should get together. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, you know, did you get, still get paid all the money even though they sacked you or do you have to give some of it back? To a, up, to a, um, to, up to a point. It's all right, isn't it? That's a long go. <laughs> Lives in Chiswick. Yeah, but the, like, the, I mean, uh, something I did find is that you can, you can move away from what you've got. What was, or kind of what you, if you want to be a journalist, what you go into it for is to ask people questions. And... Especially once daybreak had finished. And I thought, you know, daybreak's figures weren't much different when we stopped doing it to what they are now. It's just got a bigger, it's got a bigger sense of itself, just yeah. Piers sheer bluster, you know, and he's a friend of mine and I, and I really like him, but, you know, he just, he's got that self confidence and bluster to so just push it through. I just, I, just haven't, you know, I just haven't got that shot in my sort of psychological locker, you know, locker yeah. at all. But, um, actually, I lost my thread. What was I saying then? I forgot what I was saying. Hang on. 
Uh, I got, I got just confused oh, no, when yeah, you no, said no, Piers Morgan had a friend. That's no, no, just no. like that. That's, that just floored me. <laughs> but I just found. <laughs> well, look, look, taking us a find. He's been, he's, he's been brilliant. But, but it's when you're doing football. Yeah. <laughs> but when, when, when you're presenting football, you don't really ask. When you're doing Champions League football, yeah. you say hello at the beginning. You ask. You've got two minutes to ask three a question each to three pundits. Yeah. And then you go an ad break. And then you come out and you ask, and well, basically, you, then you hand to Clive Tilsley. Half time, ad break, question each to three pundits, ad break, back to Clive. Afterwards, ad break, um, three more questions. Someone else does an interview with the Gabriel Clark, does the interview with the manager, and then come out bang on time. Right, it's very difficult to shine. You're just about <laughs> getting the words out in the right order, and everyone. Everyone says you're a complete fucking twat anyway when you finish. <laughs> so I never, I'd realised I never actually interviewed anybody. I actually asked, sat down and asked questions of somebody for 10, 20 minutes. Yeah. It hardly ever happened during that era. And then suddenly, when I went back on Radio 5 Live, I felt the blood flowing back into my veins. It something felt different. I thought, oh yeah, I'm actually doing what I came into this for. You know, but you know, don't get me wrong, the football job was fantastic. The crack was unbelievable. You know, World Cups... You know, flying off to Madrid, you know, to, to M M Munich, whatever, and, and far off place in Moldova, you know, I'll treasure those times. Yeah. But it was less about the football and the broadcasting than just wandering around town, speaking to locals, you know, eating the food, you know, it was a, a brilliant experience. I mean, to get to do it at all is an incredible thing. And that, you see this, you know, and I, it's, you see, it's very rare for anybody in any of these businesses, you know, in, in anything to do with showbiz, especially in TV, to just work constantly at a high level. So there's ups and downs yeah, for everyone. Yeah. And I think the ups and downs are really important, right? You know, I think like if you just keep on going on that trajectory and then, pff, then, yeah. then you will be a dick and you will not have everything in perspective and you won't be doing what you actually no, want no. to do. So no, it's, it's interesting. Yeah. But it's interesting now when people say, I mean, at the moment I do, a, I do two, three hour shows on Five Live, they're solo speech shows. Now, the, the difference with that is, off the back of that, if it's, I'm not saying it's any good, but if it is any good, you've bloody earned it and you've done it yourself. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. There's nowhere to hide on a solo speech show for, for three hours. And so, you know, that makes it better when you then get on the tram and somebody says, why aren't you on telly anymore? You know, <laughs> oh, I don't know. Actually, I said another, also on the tram, I swear this is true. Monday morning, I was, you, you work your sweat on Mondays, on the tram. And I was in a grump. It was morning. It was half seven. It was winter. The tram was busy. And a bloke said, um, you're not on telly anymore. I went, no. And I go, so, so what are you doing now? And I literally, I heard myself say, I hadn't planned it. I went, uh, I'm a shepherd. <laughs> <laughs> and he went, oh. <laughs> No further question. <laughs> like, where are your sheep? Where's your crook? <laughs> Just what are you doing on a tram in Manchester <laughs> if you're a shepherd? It's on my way out to the sheep. Yeah. They got on the other tram, they're <laughs> off to the bloody airport, the twats. <laughs> the other one, the other, I said this, um, uh, there's a mate of mine lives not far from here, Jonathan Trott, you know, one of the greatest batsmen ever, you know, and then he, he's, he's retired, from the, retired from cricket now. And uh, we go, we, we spend quite a time, time together, both into baseball, so occasionally go over the States for a sort of, break and watch baseball over there and it's something we just before he retired I said there's a word you're going to hate there's a word you're going to hate and that word is pipeline <laughs> people talk to you people be nice you said anything in the pipeline <laughs> that becomes a killer it sounds like nothing <laughs> but you know the pipeline question so I said so as whenever I said to him whenever anyone says the question when everyone uses the word pipeline just send me a text that says cunt <laughs> and I'll know what's happening, and vice versa. So wherever we are in the world, and he's been off coaching the England A's in India, I just suddenly get three o'clock in the morning, cunt. That means, that means somebody has asked the pipeline question. Do you end up making stuff up? You know, well, I've, you know, I've got some shepherding work coming through or something like that, but... I mean, it was interesting, actually, is since I did that drinking programme, that conversation has changed because... Instead of you not on telly anymore, it's kind of, you know, how's your drinking going? 
good luck with your struggle, you know, which like, comes from a good place. It's not quite like that. But you know, that's had a bigger impact than, you know, anything I've, I've ever done, you know, just yeah. stumbled into that. Well, that's interesting. So, what, you just worked out that you were drinking like 100 units a week just well, you know, your not social even that. I just or... thought it's an issue. I thought to some extent, to some extent, we are, um, you know, to some extent, we're, we're, we're all, ad- everyone who drinks is slightly addicted slightly addicted to alcohol. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was just a conversation with Frank Skinner, and he looked horrified. We, and we were having dinner somewhere, and it, he was saying, but you're fine. I mean, you have a couple of pints. He said, I envy your level of drinking. You know, I couldn't do that. You know, as he would describe himself, he was a, you know, a bedwetting, perno in the morning type alcoholic. Yeah. You know, and I certainly wasn't that. And the trouble is, the most coverage of drinking that you get, of alcoholism, like everything else in the media, it's the extreme end. Yeah. So it's all that. Perno in the morning, blue lights, liver disease and everything. So the rest of us drinkers would look at that and think, well, I'm not like that. Yeah, yeah. Ergo, I'm all right. When I thought, well, are we all right? But I said to Frank at this dinner, I said, look, if, there was a, if my 50 best friends had gathered in a place across the road to see me tonight for my birthday, I would be looking forward to it so much less if I couldn't drink. And Frank was staggered. I mean, I'm coming from him. He said, really? He said, well, perhaps you have got a kind of a problem. So... But I didn't know how much I was drinking until literally the first day of filming, where I did some, did some filming in a pub before, and I had four pints of Guinness, which before a game, especially actually, to be fair, for a 12.30 kickoff, so I was in there at 10. <laughs> right. Which is rare, but by no means unheard of. And then I didn't drink anything all afternoon, and then, and then went back to London. It was my mate's 40th birthday, so I went to that. I had a couple of beers when I went in, quite a bit of wine, then another beer went somewhere else. And we were filming the following day and I counted it up and that was 36 units. I remember at that moment the penny dropped, actually, <laughs> once you count it. So that is two and a half times more than's good for you in a week, yeah. drunk in one night. And I thought, blimey. The, the, bloke, the um, a bloke came to me, uh, came to me, I was at the Blues Albion game in St Andrews, it must have been September, October. It's, it's amazing people's you know, really wanting to talk about it. So, I, you know, people were clambering over seats at half time to come and sort of talk to me and everything about, about the drinking and their drinking. So I had what amounted to a kind of a, a public health seminar in the away end at, at St Andrews. And one bloke said to me, he said, I'll get you, I'll get you. I saw, I saw what you did. I said, yeah, I'll get you. I'm, yeah, I'm like that. Um, he said, but I'm drinking. Do you think this is too much? He goes, I'm drinking 50 pints a week. Do you think that's too much? And it's interesting how much, having spent a lot of time with doctors and, and hepatologists, I've become a bit of a you know, celebrity figure for them to speak to. It's amazing how you, you start talking, Dr. Cobbler. So instead of saying, of course it's too fucking much, you idiot, you went, well, you might consider cutting down a little bit. <laughs> but, my, but my point to him, what I said to him, was that, look, if you're really enjoying all of those 50 pints, you're loving the bones of every one of them, then well, I'd honestly say, fuck it, just drink them. But what I found, well, I, read, and I, I, I made a little back-of-the-envelope calculation. So I started drinking, what, 15 in Hagley, getting served underage in pubs and whatnot. If you lined up all my drinks in all those years, right, I reckon that, I calculated that would be between three and a half and four miles long. Right. If you lined them all up. Yeah. I just thought, the real tragedy is this. How many of those drinks did I really want, stroke, enjoy, stroke, need? Right, and I reckon... It's no more than a third. The rest of them have just been, it's just sort of habit, drinking yeah. for the sake of drinking. You the know, first couple just, are kind of, you know, you get, I, I, if you can drink like a, a pint and a half, you get to quite a nice little yeah, mellow ab- stage, no, but then you ruin it by drinking another no, pint. Absolutely, but absolu- absolute, yeah, absolutely right. The rest beyond that is just habit. You see, I was with Lee Mack last night working on a, a programme at Sky, and Lee stopped drinking. I think he's got some role with uh, alcohol concern. I said, well, why, why did you stop? And he said, well, he said, I realised it was all bollocks. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, the drink I really enjoyed, he said, was the, the first, but which, what everyone always says, it's the first pint, you, you know, you get in the bottle, the first glass of wine. You know, mm. oh. Now, we've all had that, and that's what I kept talking about in the film. That's what I, that's what I, you know, couldn't do without. And he said, well, that feeling's bollocks. And I'll tell you why it's bollocks. It's because it takes half an hour for that alcohol to get in your bloodstream. So whatever you're feeling at that moment you drink the first pint, it is not the physiological effect of alcohol 
on your system, and it might be the anticipation of that feeling coming. In fact, that's what it must be. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, I thought that's, that, you know, that's a good point. But an interesting discovery, by the way, I made since making that program, just writing stuff for the, 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 liver, the liver specialists, is that looking at the figures of how much people drink, right, 5% of people drink loads, right, which is plainly unsafe. I mean, north of 60, 70 units every week. And actually, I was well edging towards that. Then another 25% drink between 14 units a week and 35 units for women or 50 units for men a week, or in that bracket where you are causing some harm. And I found, I had a scan on my liver, and it was, you know, I've got some level of fibrosis from what drinking's done, so I kind of had to cut down, but th that's that. That's another 25%. So the shocking statistic to me is that 70% of all drinkers are actually drinking 14 units or less. Yeah. Now, that's amazing because nearly every drinker I speak to had bollocks. That's bollocks. Now, it's not, you know, as much as anybody can, can, you know, it's a huge sample based on a huge amount of research. So that is really amazing to me. So one of the many excuses drinkers like me used to give, you know, I don't drink, you know, there are millions of them. Uh, uh, no, I haven't got a problem because I do a lot of exercise, because I don't drink during the day, because I don't drink on my own, because this, I don't drink spirits, I don't, you know, this, that and the other. I don't, I don't mix drinks. All these, all these bollocks. Another one of those was, well, everybody drinks. Well, actually, not everybody drinks. No. And also, m the vast majority of the people who do drink are keeping it to 14 units or less. You know, so it, 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 is, it is basically possible. Lightweight, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting, I mean, you do, you do, it, my whole, not social life, my whole way of interacting with people is built around drink. Like, yeah. I think that's I'd the say, problem. Well, you know, there's a friend of mine, it's Karen, we're going for a drink after. I wouldn't know, kind of, what else would we do if we didn't go for a drink? We can't drink coffee for hours. We can't go for a walk. <laughs> what is there to do apart from drink? Life's got no meaning without it. <laughs> drink water. I, herbal teas are nice. I haven't had but, a drink. You, but you can't sit in a pub for four hours. You can. And, and drink herbal tea. You no, can. you can't. You can't. Oh, <laughs> it's nice. Uh, do sign up for Beer 52 as well, if you... If you like. <laughs> um, so... I wouldn't do it, because I don't drink anymore. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's ask... People will be cross if I don't ask you some emergency questions, so yeah. I'm going to ask you some emergency questions. Can I get a picture of the audience with the lights up at some stage? I'm sure we can, just yeah. Like to... We can do that. I'm sure we can put the lights up and have a picture of the audience. Can we do that? We can do it later if you want. No? OK, we can't. No, we can't. <laughs> I mean, I'm a bit terrified of, of seeing a thousand Birmingham people <laughs> yeah. in one place with the lights on. They're all cardboard cutouts at the back <laughs> that your agents put in. There might be no, yeah, no one can turn the lights on. Oh, there's a man moving. It could just be someone leaving who doesn't want to be seen by Adrian Charles. <laughs> the last Sorry, yeah, thing. Go on. Have you ever seen a ghost? Hey. Yeah, so. <laughs> maybe. Oh! Hey. What a time oh, for that. Blimey. But Hang even with the lights on, there's a big lot of swathe of people there that the light is repelled by. <laughs> <laughs> just seemed dark. Oh, the magic oh, is... <laughs> <laughs> How'd you get a dirty lens? Okay. Wave, everybody, or make wanker signs or something. Wave! Yay! <laughs> like it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Please turn the lights out again. <laughs> <laughs> um, have you seen a ghost? Have you seen? Have you ever seen a ghost? Um, I no, I don't. I don't know. Sometimes I get funny feelings in the middle of the night. Do you? I feel yeah. paranoid. <laughs> you have that. So you end up with a dirty lens you know, on I've your phone. Ever, <laughs> I've only ever had one wet dream. Really? <laughs> yeah. Answering questions I haven't asked yet. <laughs> yes. These are all good. Uh, and I remember it. How many wet dreams? I remember it precisely. Yeah. I remember where it was. It was my mum's house in Croatia. Yeah. And I was about, I know I wasn't driving. I know I wasn't able to drive at the time because the dream, <laughs> the dream. If involved... anyone's had a wet dream when they're driving, no. that is very bad news. <laughs> <laughs> but I was in bed. I was yeah. in bed with my brother, three okay. years younger than me. Okay, That'd not that he knew. He didn't. I didn't ejaculate all over him. Really. <laughs> but I. The dream was. 
I was in, I was, I was in Croatia on this island, and I had a dream that I was driving my mum's light blue Ford Cavalier out of the multi-storey car park in Stourbridge. Okay. And every time, because you go down a ramp and a longer bit, and then another ramp and yeah. round. And every time I went down a ramp, went, ooh, and then around, and then ooh, and then finally when I came out into the open air onto the Stourbridge ring round, yeah. I, I, I ejaculated. <laughs> Is this the kind of thing you want? Yeah, well, well, I'll right. take it. It seems to be coming whether I want it or not. Have you ever driven down that that since? Subsequently, or were you scared to drive down? No, I have. In fact, when I got a mass at yeah. Stourbridge, that's where I park. Is it? Enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Jesus is a kind of ghost, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. So Could you've seen? That. Have you ever seen Jesus? Um, well, Jesus is in all of us. Is he? Yeah. yeah. No, I don't. Not 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 as uh, not as far. But as you are. You're re you're religious. You did you did a kind of. I did I did fifty dates in fifty days once. You did 46 masses in 46 yeah, days yeah. for Lent, was it? See, that's just after I got the boot from. Uh, that's just after I got the boot from ITV, and I was, and I just, I was down in. I thought Ash Wednesday, everyone goes. Yeah, Catholics go to mass, and I went. I was in South Wales, and I, I found a little church. So I go for mass. Oh, that was. It was really interesting. It was a really little church in a, a crappy area of Swansea, and. It was really a nice little mass, and I was down there the following day. I thought, I'll go to another mass on the Thursday, and then went to another mass on the Friday at a different place. And I sort of thought, can I do this for 46 days? And it became a bit of a, a sort of a project. And actually, it was just something I was doing. I mean, maybe I was having a nervous breakdown at the time. <laughs> Who knows? But I remember talking to Frank about it, and he said, God, even the Pope hasn't had 46 different <laughs> priests say mass to him. You should write something about it. So, so I wrote something about it for the tablet, a Catholic magazine. I ended up kind of making a a television programme. What, what, what I thought was interesting about it, actually, I realised how important the kind of priest is to proceedings, which sounds obvious, but whether or not I got anything out of it depended on the priest. And I found, you know, a third of the priests were good, a handful, sort of life-changingly brilliant, lovely people. A third was sort of okay. You know, and a third were absolutely shit. <laughs> I mean, you can't stand in front of an audience, you know, go and talk about great joy and everything, looking as though you've just had your phone bill or something. Just, you know, just, just not looking pleased to see you. When you talk to people about priests, and they say, yeah, they sometimes say, yeah, he's very good with people. Well, I said, well, that's like saying about a footballer, yeah, he's got a kick in a ball. I mean, it seems to me it's the first, yeah. you know, absolute requirement, number one, is to be good with people. But in a way, it did sort of change my life doing that. I just got on a sort of different, not on a different spiritual path, almost sort of a different career path, not that that's why I did it. But it was, no, it was, it was interesting. I can tell you bored shitless. I'm not bored. You want to talk about ejaculation I was instead. Just, I was wondering about all the units you must have drunk with all those masses. But that's, no, that's actually... They it turns into no, Jesus' I was, blood, I though, so it's fine. I right? wasn't drinking for Lent. I wasn't okay. drinking for Lent either. So, okay. uh, but you can drink the wine because it turns into Jesus' blood, and you believe that because you're a Catholic, so uh, you're fine. You come, that's true. Yeah, I mean, you've become a vampire, but that's not as yeah. bad as drinking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's true. <laughs> Don't try and get me on Catholic <laughs> theology. I, it's above my pay grade. <laughs> Why does God let bad things happen to <laughs> most people? He said, well, it's interesting that, since you ask, because I remember after the Manchester bombing, um, I was doing the, I, I was uh, I, sort of down there on the scene for three hours the following morning, you know, which is obviously massive. And I was just, people were saying, well, how can God let that happen? It's kind of part of the narrative of those things. And with those things, look, I'm no theologian, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm, really not much better than an agnostic, probably, in some, certainly in some Catholic eyes. But for me, that's quite similar to explain. You see life as a triumph of good over evil or evil over good. Sometimes evil triumphs over good. So I've got no trouble explaining that in, sort of, in terms of what God does or doesn't do. But when something happens like the, you know, the, the cyclone in southern Africa now or... You know, for, you know, a kid. I mean, it was when I, was, I remember I was filming that religious program. I was really, I was in Rome. And I had a really nice priest there and talking. And I was just checking my, we were driving somewhere. I was just checking my phone, like the BBC News phone. And I saw a kid in Sunderland. A toddler had died choking on a grape. And I just suddenly thought the great sweep of 
of religious history suddenly meant nothing. You know, gone from a believer in that moment to, I'll fucking give over. You know, how, how can that happen? So look, God, I'm, no, I'm not sure. I just, I just don't know. Yeah. You know, or just for me, just go and sit in a Catholic church, you know, not during mass. Sometimes it feels, mass feels like a penance, that mean, a membership of the club to allow you to go and sit in a Catholic church. You just think, oh, yeah, that's nice now. You know, that, that's it. How can I go from ejaculation to Catholicism? <laughs> it's, impre- it's like being on the one show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let me ask you another emergency question. It's a good answer. Another answer might be, there is no God. Uh, that is, that's, that's, there's no one looking after anything where it's all a pointless waste of time. <laughs> so, <laughs> let's look, just for the people of Birmingham, let's go very old school. Would you rather have a hand made out of ham? Yeah. They'd just, just be happy. Sorry, say it. that again, say that again. Would you rather have, we've only got halfway through. Would you rather have a hand made out of ham or an armpit that dispenses sun cream? <laughs> if that was the choice. You can ask subsidiary questions or just sun, answer sun straight. cream, definitely. Sun cream, yeah, yeah. No, don't like no. Why? <laughs> Why? Why would you make that choice? Tr- the hand will grow back if you eat it slowly. Uh, yeah, but I'm vegetarian anyway. So yeah, but it's well, not. It's not made out of. Uh, it's well, it's not, animal matter. No, it's not. It's it, it's you've created out of your own. Would you eat your own fingernails? No. no. Look. Would you eat? You can't question me. You asked me a straight question. You, I told you a straight answer. I can answer. question I just you. The, I'm factor, going to press you, no. Minister. I'd have factor 20 out of one armpit oh, yeah. and factor 50 out of the other. <laughs> OK. <laughs> it's only one armpit and you're allowed, you only get one factor and you have to All stick right, with I'll go. Factor. I'll go for factor 50. I was talking to some dermatologists and they say, no suntan is healthy. You know, cells are dying. So yeah. you've got to... Anyway, it's your public health announcement. <laughs> Stay below 14 units a week and never no, get a No drinking, track. no going out. Midlands football is shit and we're all going to hell in a handcart. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Have a lovely afternoon. No. <laughs> we've done very well. We've been going, oh God, we're going to be going for ages. I'm going to end, we're going to end soon because I, I want to go home. <laughs> it's quite nice doing one in the afternoon, isn't it? It's, uh, I could go home and just miss the kids. Bare bath times, it's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely perfect. Um... I went. I, I went, I went. Have you ever seen a Bigfoot? Uh, not that I recall. Good to no, think about it. No. Um, all right. If you could have a... I'm going to make this a new question. If you had a finger that could travel through time, <laughs> what, what would you do with your finger and where would it go? You, it, it creates a small wormhole and you're able to look through, but you can only get a finger in and then you can flick something, I don't know, touch something. <laughs> yeah, that's, it's like that. It's very much like that, yeah. It's very similar... To, very similar to the rimming. It's actually very similar to rimming. Which I guess you could do if you could persuade, like, Napoleon to stick his ass up against the hole. <laughs> They've turned the lights back on again. Oh, my God. Scary. Uh, is there anything you'd like to do with your yeah. finger in time? Oh, this might be telling us we have to stop. I don't know. Or is... I, can't, um, I can't believe you've had to sign all this. <laughs> um, what does she do for ejaculation? <laughs> <laughs> what does she do for a wet dream coming down uh, the <laughs> car park I uh, <laughs> the worst day I've ever had following the Albion sorry to, to go on and bang on about the Albion was the the playoff final of uh, the playoff final of would have been 2007 I think uh, where we we lost to Derby County 1-0 at Wembley. Oh, shut up. <laughs> um, did, did Giles Barnes score that goal? Can you remember? Were you there? Anyway, I think, Derby. I'm think i pretty Derby's. sure Giles Barnes scored the goal. Now, as he went on that run towards the goal, I would run alongside him as fast as I could. I'd have to train because he was really quick, Giles Barnes. And at the moment he pulled the trigger to shoot, I would have inserted my index finger into his bottom. <laughs> And if he still scored in those conditions, then fair play. They can have that. <laughs> it's a good answer. Well, what kind of other answers have you had for that? Well, all sorts of amazing things. I mean, no, it's not a good question. Uh, that was a good answer. You can uh, hit, poke Hitler. I need to get. I need to. 
what's, what's Hitler? That, yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's what I'd have done. Yeah. I mean, most of what you do is just made up as you go along, isn't it? <laughs> can you just say stuff so I can get this you, What, you're filming it? this? Yeah, it's been should... filmed, but I've done it this, so we can get oh, you yeah, the no, no, no. copy of <laughs> Go on, say stop. Hello, everyone, in Adrian Charles' phone. Who knows who this is going to? Hello, Adrian Charles' brother. Sorry about what happened to you that time in bed with him. It, <laughs> it wasn't an ectoplasm, like he said. <laughs> uh, have you got enough? Well, I'm just going to leave it there. Okay, you're going to leave it. I will keep going. I don't know whether we, we... Do we have to wrap up? Is that what the lights are on for? Or I just saw my producer walk out that door, so I don't know, that's a <laughs> chilling moment. <laughs> uh, st You've still got film in the camera, Chris? Yeah, it's fine, OK. Well, we won't do too much more. Let's, uh, let's see what else. Uh, you, uh, you want to raise £60,000 by shaving off your beard? Uh, well, yeah, we were scrubbling around for... Uh, yeah, I, this, I, I came back after Christmas with a beard. And, um, and this might have brought about the end of my career on the, uh, on the one show, actually. Because I came back to Christmas with this beard and someone said, oh, it looks all right, so I left it on. So I left it on and people started commenting on it. Actually, and then it, and I thought, oh, I'll just leave it on, so it became a thing. But then the controller, who then later went on with the Chris Evans business to yeah. quite effectively boot me off on Fridays, somebody told me that she'd rung up and said, Adrian, the, tell Adrian the beard goes. <laughs> And I was dying to shave it off, but at that point, I'm thinking, fuck this. I don't care. I, I end up looking like a submarine captain. I'm leaving this beard on. So it turned into a bit of a thing. So in the end, the compromise was that I got it shaved off to raise money for, um, I think, to children in need. So I was scrabbling around, for, scrabbling around for sponsors to do it. And in the end, I just called Alan Sugar. I said, can you help me out? He said, yeah, I'll give you 60 grand. That's fine, just do it. So to be fair. <laughs> To be fair, he did. Remember, that beard was even reviewed in the Daily Telegraph. <laughs> and I was very... I'm not really a natural sort of beard grower. And um, there was a, I think it's a guy called Christopher Howes who writes for the Telegraph, and he reviewed it. He's got a big beard himself. He said, you know, he said, it's not much of a beard, but at least Charles has got past the Yasser Arafat stage. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, that's as much as you can hope for, isn't it? I'd gone sort of post-Arafat. <laughs> well, my producer walked through that door, went like this, and then also let the door slam, which is very poor producing. <laughs> so if you heard it slam on the audio version, that was Ben Walker, our producer, who I'm indebted to for his work. He's at the back smirking as if he's, that's a cool thing to do. You'll be sacked. Like, I'm going to be like Adrian Charles. You're tying my shoelaces from now on, and I'm going on to Stuart Goldsmith's podcast <laughs> for a record fee. Um, I'm not used to live audiences. No, you get, you know, okay. no but seriously, you get... Can't but you might have 20, 20 million people watching an England game yeah. or something. You can't see the fuckers. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> but no, you can see them. They look quite happy, though. He'll be using this later on for his wet dream material, don't you worry? <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I think we're going to have to wrap up because, you know, Birmingham can only take so much excitement and I don't know what's going to come out your mouth next. Uh, <laughs> but ladies and gentlemen... Don't film it when hang she's not bit. doing anything. Hang on a bit. There we go. I th hang on a bit. I think... How did she do this? I think the signing woman is brilliant. Hey. <laughs> That's just made her look like the most arrogant person in the world. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's another lady as well backstage. So. Anyway, please give a massive round of applause. He's one of yours. You have to, you have yeah, to take, tough luck, I am, sorry. The chin. What, you got anything else in the pipeline? Oh, God. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Adrian Giles! Run. 
How do you like them Sky potatoes? <laughs>